Well, let's continue worshiping together by opening our Bibles to First Peter. We're now squarely in the middle of chapter 2. And this morning we're going to be studying verses 11 through 17 together. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. So there, beginning in verse 11, Peter writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And with that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray this morning that you would give your spirit to bury the truth of it deep within our hearts in a way that is so profitable and fruitful in our lives as individual believers and as a church in this world. We ask it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the marvels of history has to be the spread of Christianity throughout the old Roman Empire. You have this this minor mystery religion from the eastern Mediterranean growing to supplant the well-endowed, respectable cults of that Roman Empire so that it actually became the established religion. (laughs) We know this happened. But, But how did it happen? That's what Alan Creeder tackles in his book. It's called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. His novel argument is that the impulse behind the spread of the gospel wasn't exactly evangelism as we think of it. In fact, of all the the writings available to us from that era, we find little formal instruction about sharing the faith. Indeed, literary evidence suggests that there were no, no missions agencies, right? no coordinated missions efforts. There were no parachurch operations. Uh, there were scores of church officers, but besides maybe Gregory in the 3rd century and then Patrick, we just had St. Patrick's Day, right? Patrick in the 5th century, there were really no self-conscious evangelists or missionaries of note, like maybe the Apostle Paul. And because of persecution... It appears they seldom, if ever, use their worship services for evangelistic purposes. Too much danger. Still, the gospel spread and the church grew. But how? A creator argues that it was due to the church's fermenting patience. It was patience that leaders like Justin or Clement or Tertullian or Cyprian, it was patience that leaders like these actually did write about. Patience. And by it, here's what they meant, that the church 
assuming the watchful eye of a critical world set their hopes squarely on Christ's return and persisted then in making their faith visible for all to see. Now they called it habitus, reflexive bodily behavior. The body of Christ wasn't just to speak the gospel, it was to embody the gospel. There was to be an agreement between what they spoke and then how they lived. And that agreement was mission critical. It was mission critical, especially when persecution came. It was their patience in gospel living under trial that attracted unbelievers to it. And it was this patience or persistence not just in speaking great things, but in living great things that accounted more than anything, says Creter, for the early spread of the gospel. Interesting. It made the message of Christ and Him crucified credible enough to garner a legitimate hearing, a hearing that, as we know from Romans 10, is liable to produce faith. In Christ. Now, we know from a week ago that evangelistic proclamation is at the heart of God's mercy and purpose with us. The Christian and the Christian church cannot be both silent and at the same time obedient. Do you hear me? We cannot be both silent and obedient. Preaching God's excellencies in Christ, are front and center for God's church, Christ's church. And what we're to see today is that far from casting shade on the vital light of our public life for Christ, it makes that life indispensable. For the sake of our witness, the gospel we speak must be sported by us. Christ has has lit a lamp, far be it from us then, to put that lamp under a basket. And this is how Peter begins to help us all the way through the middle of chapter 4 of this letter. He now teaches us about the public life, even the civic life, that of necessity patiently adorns the gospel. In essence, he urges us as sojourners in this world on our way to heaven to do God's kind of good in a not-so-good kind of world. So, let's come to our text. And in our text, we find Peter's urgent plea to the church in general, then applied first in how we relate to the governing authorities that are around us. And so, to begin, let's consider Peter's urgent plea in general. We see it in verses 11 and 12. Beloved, he writes, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct, your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I think we can sum up Peter's urgent imperative like this. Church, God's loved ones, live before the world so as to commend God. Live before the world so as to commend God and Christ. Don't be like Israel of old, whose corporate life, ungodly as it was, blasphemed God's name among the Gentiles, as Paul says in Romans 2. No, don't be like that as you've been effectually called by God, and you've now been internally equipped by God, be different. Be a different kind of people. Be God's people. Commend Christ. Be an actual draw to the gospel. Be glue. Be a gravitational pull towards the truth of saving grace. And Peter's saying, this is urgent for us. It is urgent for us. Why? Because, as we saw a week ago, we now exist to make much of God in Christ. And our life 
together, distinct as it should be, in goodness and in good motive, serves to confirm the truth of that message. Our conduct, to use Peter's word, is really an apologetic for or against the message of the gospel. And we want it to be for the message of the gospel. And with unbelieving charges apparently already swirling about against the church, Peter then finds it an urgent matter that the church put those charges to bed by doing good. Real good. And that begins by winning the war against ourselves. It begins by being holy. And in, enemy number one is, is not the world out there. It's the war inside of us. It's you. It's me, myself, and I. It's new us versus what's left of old us. Now, Peter, in this letter, has said some remarkable things about us, hasn't he? How in Christ, we are loved by God from all eternity. Chosen, renewed, washed, purified, sanctified, adopted, guarded, commissioned, holy. But none of that means we're ever perfected here. Now, we are free from the power of sin. And we need to hear that. We are free from sin's power. But that doesn't mean we're above temptation. It doesn't mean we don't sin, unfortunately. It certainly doesn't mean we're to be at peace with our remaining depravity. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to be friends with what Peter calls here our flesh, that soul-killing part of us that flourished once upon a time under the reign of sin and spiritual ignorance. And even now, what remains of it makes war and would kill us if we are not busy about killing it. You feel it, don't you? When tempted to sin? When tempted to indulge what you now know to be ungodly passions? When tempted to retreat again into the world's kind of pleasure? Day after day, you've felt the heat of the battle, you've felt the violent tug of war, and it is war. And for our joy... And for Christ and His glory, we must make war against ourselves. We must crucify, to borrow from Paul, we must crucify our flesh if we would truly live to God. It is so easy and too often seen for Christians and churches to forfeit, to wave the white flag to the ideas, conventions, pursuits, and pleasures of the world. Jesus warns us about it frequently. Right? Judas and Demas are models of it. Israel was like all the other nations, but we're to be different. Right? Salt and light. And again, that begins with you and me fighting off what would dim and destroy us. It begins with us asserting against sin the actual power that Christ has given us over it. But Peter, listen, Peter is concerned about our conduct. That's not fundamentalism. That's what the Bible says. Our conduct matters. Peter's concerned about our conduct. And I want us to see that our conduct is the outcome. Just listen here. Our conduct is the outcome or the result or the victor between our flesh and our souls. 
between what's old in us and what's new in us, between ungodly desires and the leading of God, the Holy Spirit. If it is the flesh that wins, we will sin. If it is Christ in us that wins out, Christ comes out of us. So when Peter calls us to keep our conduct honorable, again, he is urging us to besiege our flesh, cut it off, but then feed our souls to win this war. Beloved, what is your daily diet spiritually? What are you taking in? Are we spiritually flabby? Or are we fit for war? Are we indulgers of the flesh? Or are we soldiers of Christ in truth arrayed? Well, it appears a great part of the battle is simply remembering who we are. It's an identity issue, isn't everything. Right? What reinforcement do we have against the vices of this world? It's keeping in mind that we are, as Peter calls us, sojourners and exiles. This world is not our home. We're not meant to be cozy and contented here. We're God's elect what? Exiles. We're God's elect exiles. Yes, we live in this world. Yes, we're citizens of it. And yes, we're to be the very best sort of those citizens. But that entails us being strangers to it and it to us. When we make ourselves at home here in malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander and sensuality and a flood of debauchery, we testify falsely that the world is more satisfying than God. That the promises of sin are better than those of our Savior. That our hope is in this life and not, in fact, in that living hope. That indeed, Christ is dead. Or at least not worth all the trouble. But what a lie to avoid at all costs. Like Moses, we should be happy to forego all the treasures of Egypt just to be numbered among the heirs of God. Right? Beloved, we're to live this life as advancing towards the city of God. Not as moral settlers, but as chosen and precious exiles sanctified sojourners, those who have been called out of darkness and brought into God's marvelous light. Now, how that does put a spotlight then on us. The natives are quick to spot the strangers. So, in the Old Testament, and I'm thinking of a case in Sodom, You'll find often, though, that it was risky to enter the city as a stranger. Why? Because eyes were on you. Eyes were on you. And sadly, in that case of Sodom, you could be an angel of God and draw out nothing but the vilest abuses of the townies. Well, church, listen, it isn't just before God that we live our life together. This world is a watching one. And, again, it's not like we're to be hiding either. Again, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but sets it on a stand for all to see. And so, as we live among the Gentiles, meaning mainly here unbelievers, 
as we live among unbelievers and they see us across the, the yard, at the dinner table, at the grocery store, on the sidelines of the flag football game, in our office space, at ballet practice, at school functions, at city council meetings, on social media. Peter's alerting us that our conduct is under the microscope as God has intentioned it to be. He's made us strangers to display for natives the truth that's made us kind of strange. You see, unbelievers are looking for any reason to discredit Christianity. To cry Ichabod at God, I see no glory in Him. To have their biases confirmed and their uneasy consciences set at ease. It's just sort of built into their unbelief. Anything to keep me from Jesus. And as they'll hardly pick up a Bible, much less investigate it, where do you suppose they look to reinforce their presumptions, or if more honest, form an opinion about the truth of the gospel? At you. At our life together. Your conduct as a Christian and our characteristics as a church in this world. And see, Peter says they already largely presuppose the worst. There's nothing to that. It's all hypocrites, a bunch of haters, subversive strangers, evildoers. Evildoers. And they say as much. So Peter's saying, with all the urgency he can muster, stop talking and show them differently. Be more than a church with a big mouth. Be a church also with massive hearts and holy minds and good hands and useful feet. Don't give them anything, nothing, except an undeniable view of Christ in you. Of sanctified souls on a mission to confirm the truth of the gospel by a public conduct and care that brings them face to face with God and His regenerating power. And the practicality of gospel faith. And the hope that we have in the risen and returning Christ. Live today so that the unbeliever has no ground of charge tomorrow. Live so that the only charge they can accurately bring is that we belong to another king. Live to tear down their straw man. Live so that they can see their opinion was actually in error. See, there is a clear missional impulse here. How many have ultimately come to Christ because they've tasted the Christ-likeness of Christ's people? Stories abound. Stories abound. But, before we move on, it's important to see that the world's response to our righteousness is not the final basis for continuing in it. Okay? Of course, we pray. We pray that as with a Rosaria Butterfield, the experienced good of Christians would lead every soul to the experienced goodness of Christ. That here and now, all would glorify God for the root-exposing fruit of real Christianity. But, as that will not always be the case, Peter roots our endurance, as he often has, in that return 
of Christ. Our conduct, no matter how godly, may be condemned for that very reason in the court of public opinion. But that's not where our vindication rests. It rests, as we see in our passage, in the courtroom of Christ. So that when He returns, all the world will truly see that what they saw in us was nothing short of the handiwork of God within our hearts. Think of Agatha. Anybody seen the, the, the most recent remake of Beauty and the Beast? Nobody? Yeah, okay. Whew. Well, this may not make a whole lot of sense to you. I think of Agatha uh, in the remake of, of Beauty and the Beast there, if you can. It's her thing to do good. Indeed, her name means good. Agatha, good. But Agatha is poor. She's dressed in rags. Right? She's put out of the city of man. She's mocked by society's finest. But what do we come to know about Agatha? But that in truth, she's this enchantress, right? She's actually the very embodiment of a supernatural kind of beauty that shows in the end. And just so, it will be seen of us. It will be seen of Christians. And God will be glorified for it when all is revealed at last by Christ. So, patience in well-doing. And urgency to. Now, this has all been a general setup for specific applications that Peter wants to make for us over the next third of the letter, starting with how we relate as a church to our governing authorities. So, look with me in verse 13. This is what Peter writes there. He says, Be subject for the Lord's sake. To every human institution, whether it be to emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. And so one way we do real good, God's kind of good, is by submitting to the authorities God set in place for the good order of civil society. And little could be more distinct in our world today. Our culture is currently ripe with rage against such authority. Riots seem to be happening daily. Anarchists are running freely. Groups are storming the White House. And people in general are just wildly anti-authoritarian. But we're to be different. We're to understand the hand behind all structures of authority. Uh, what people make of that authority and how we're to respond to its abuse is one thing. But that's not Peter's point just yet. It's simply that government, as Paul says in Romans 13, has actually been instituted by God to serve His purpose in restraining sin and rewarding righteousness. The purpose Peter spies out for us in our text. Friends, even evil governments are better in this sense than total anarchy. And Peter is not blissfully ignorant on this. Peter has read the Old Testament. Peter has reckoned with evil regimes in Egypt, Pharaoh. He has reckoned with Persia, Assyria, Babylon, and quite often Israel. He's quite aware then and there of Rome's intolerance of Christianity and the many griefs, as he's written about, written about in this letter, the many griefs it was bringing upon the church that he loved so much. But he also understood God's sovereignty and the Lord's submissiveness. The Lord's submissiveness 
we're to understand that God ordained government. It's His minister. And it's to be respected at the very least for its divine origin and design. And I get it. The bath water is diseased and dark and dirty. We're just not to throw the baby out with the bath water. We don't destroy the institution of marriage because of what people make of it. And just so, we're not to destroy the institution of government because of what people make of it. Indeed, we're to honor the Lord. We're to honor the Lord by submitting to it. Now, this is not just about entrusting ourselves to His Word on this. It really is more about modeling His heart made out most visibly on the cross. We'll get there next week, but at the center of Peter's instructions for doing God's kind of good in a not-so-good kind of world, there's chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. There's Christ and Him, what? Crucified. Not just as our redemption, but as our example for how to graciously live to God even in light of the greatest earthly evils. And it's not just grit your teeth and bear it. It's more supernatural than that. It's more heavenly than that. It's bear your cross. So far as you can, it's be subject in trusting yourself to God's care and God's control. It's be like Christ. As one put it, submission defines the Christian's ways because being like the Savior describes the Christian's goal. We're to follow in the footsteps of the Prince of Peace for His sake. We submit. But now, not uncritically, and so not universally, the authority of our government is not absolute. And Peter makes this crystal clear concerning that of Rome. It is not Caesar that he calls Lord here. It's Christ. And that alone is treasonous. That alone is subversive. Peter says, wait, I'm not done. He also adds, hey Rome, your institutions, they're merely human. Meaning, if you're familiar with Daniel, that Rome, even in the prime of its existence, was not built to last. Peter's saying, Rome's going to fall because there's only one kingdom that stands forever. And that's God's kingdom. And to that kingdom, and to that king then, belongs our final and forever allegiance. Right? When there is a conflict between what God calls good and evil, and what our society in opposition calls evil and good, the church is obligated by Christ to dissent. As prayerfully and peaceably as possible. And then go forward wherever Jesus goes. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of the Conscience. Still, it's necessary to see that insofar as our government functions properly, Peter is calling us to adorn civil obedience. And even when it doesn't, even when we are then called to follow the Lord, Peter's saying, don't start a riot. We're not to take to the streets. We're not to take up pitchforks. We're to take up our crosses. We're to 
to take up our crosses. We're to take up prayer. We are to stand for the truth, but we're to do it in a way that, that emphasizes love. We're to do God's kind of good. And if we must, be patient under trial. And in this way, silence our shouting critics. Do you see that? That's Peter's next step. Be subject so far as you can. Be subject. Do good regardless. And by your persistence in it, put the ignorant to silence. This, Peter says, verse 15, is the will of God. This is the will of God. As Peter had to learn, it is not to whip out the sword and cut off the dude's ear. It's to sheathe it, as Jesus told him. The only sword the church is to wield in this world is that of God's Word. Let the chips fall where the Lord has ordained them to fall. Listen, Peter is not a coward, if you're thinking that. He used to be. He's not anymore. And neither is he a chump. Peter is a champion of the gospel. He's not a plush apostle writing to a hurting people from the comfort of an ivory tower. Peter will be martyred under this emperor of Rome. <laughs> you see? The governors that he speaks of that we're to be subject to, that would likely be Felix, who refused Paul, and, wait for it, Pontius Pilate, who in cowardice crucified Christ. Peter knows the deal. But it does not convince him he needs to do anything other but what God wills. And there's no mystery about it. He tells us straight. It's that we so persist in love and hope and holiness and neighborliness and graciousness even towards our enemies, even in the face of their worst intentions, that they would lose their voice. It's that our enduring kindness would take their breath away and God willing do it in a saving way. Or else. It's that it would be seen that their charges against us are motivated not by a commitment to reality, fact, and truth, but by the condition of their souls which are hardwired to hate the Christ they see in us. It's that their slander would be exposed as the offspring of an accountable spiritual ignorance and folly. God's will, beloved, in our civil obedience, and if necessary, our cross-bearing goodness, is to either awaken consciences by it, or preview the day when every mouth will be stopped and the whole world will be held accountable to God. Be subject so far as you can. Put to silence by doing good regardless. And to that end, serve God freely. This is how we keep our distinctive Christian identity in this world. Look at verses 16 and 17 as we come to our close. Peter says, Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Beloved, we are the Lord's freed indeed people. 
And yet we see what it means for us to be truly free is to be God's servants. As one put it, quote, true liberty means freedom to do what is right. Thus only those who are slaves of God are genuinely free. And Martin Luther, the great reformer, he added this, that, quote, a Christian is both a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none, and, at the same time, a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Hmm. And at the heart of that is the gospel. Through faith in the gospel, it is true to say, as Paul says, that all has become ours. <laughs> Whether life or death or present or future, even the world. We are free from sin. We are free from Satan. We are free from darkness. We are free from death and judgment and hell. And one day we will reign with Christ. Whatever authority, any authority, has over us was given it, as Jesus said to Pilate, by God Almighty, who is our Father, who loves and cares for us. We are free. Indeed. Feel that. But also this, we are free to live as glad-hearted servants of God. We are free to be about His purpose in this world, which calls us to a specific use of our freedom in Christ. It is to be a servant of all to willingly lay down our lives in order that some may be saved. Right? As Christ's heart was towards us, our freedom is concerned not to live as we please, not to say what we want, not to make license for sin, but instead to embody grace, to enact the gospel, to care for souls, and to bring glory to God. So, Peter gets specific. Four quick but potent commands. First, he says, honor everyone. Talk about a counterculture today. Honor, not just the honorable. Honor, not just those who honor you. Honor everyone. Be a people, however dishonored for Christ, however disgusted rightly by Christlessness, who still honor all. You don't have to agree with everyone to honor everyone. But so far as it depends on you, give even the worst of people their due as people. Created in God's image, with dignity and value and souls we want to win to Jesus. Don't unnecessarily make enemies. Honor everyone. And love the brotherhood. In our engagement with the world, forget not your marriage to the church. Okay? Go back to chapter 1, verse 22, through chapter 2, verse 3, and love this church like that. Brotherly, sincerely, earnestly, purely, especially when society makes it hard to be a Christian, let's not be a church that adds to but subtracts from the difficulty. Be a gospel culture where the love of Christ reigns, so that against all weariness, we are encouraged in the faith and stirred up to love and what else? Good works. We will need each other to execute a calling 
that has led Christians and churches to execution. In tangible ways, God's exiles need God's family. Don't let the hardship of following Christ or the ease offered by the world turn you away from identifying with the visible body of Jesus. Love the brotherhood. And fear God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Beloved, we are not to fear nations. We are not to fear tyrants. We're not to fear governments. We are not to fear presidents. We are not to fear policies, nor their implications for us. Here, Peter is again clear that none but God in Christ should have our hearts, should have our worship, should have our trust, should have our hope, should have our final obedience. His word alone is the rule of our faith and practice. And so where the world departs from the word of God, we as believers, as a church, must depart from the world as subjects first of this true king. Which is to say, come what may, we simply cannot consent, for example, to any redefinition of marriage or to the nullification of gender or to the legalized homicide of unborn children or to the unjust censorship of biblical ideas or to any mandate inequitably restricting the church from gathering in obedience to God's word or any of the devastating effects that such legislation would inevitably have upon our society. We simply cannot go there. We just can't. The fear of God, Solomon says, is to reject evil without fearing the penalty of doing so. It's to believe God ahead of men and so be His witnesses before them. Like Peter who once answered his opponents with the power to injure him, quote, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. But we already know. So fear God. Fear God. And yet still honor the emperor. You see that? No, it's not fear the emperor, but honor him like every other human being, for that's all he is at the end of the day, honor him. And so we will say, we need to honor Joe Biden. We need to honor him. Whatever the points of necessary departure, honor him every way we can. He's a person, nostrils in his breath, Soul in need of Christ, pray for him. Ask God to save him, to turn his heart to the good. Speak respectfully of him. Forsake the tirades. Please, for the love of the Lord Jesus, get off of social media if you must. But let whatever dissent you might have be as cordial as it can be. Do all you can to let any difference land as love. Honor all. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. As Peter describes it, this is how we're to live as free servants of God. As it relates to those who govern us, this is how we shed the light of another kingdom and our Savior King. It's by doing God's kind of good in a not-so-good kind of world. It's the church living a public life, a civic life, that quiets a watching world so that they can actually hear us proclaim God's excellencies in Jesus Christ. Unbelieving friend, hear now. Whatever distinguishing fruit you see in any of us, be it holy conduct 
winning subjection, patience under trial, endurance in doing good, sincerity of life, compassionate conviction, dignifying dogmatism, it all has one great root. Christ crucified and raised and God's mercy towards us in Him. He's the only way to glory. And so I would plead with you now to turn from your sin and to trust in Him and to take up your cross forgiven and follow Him. Then you come and talk to us about it. We'd love to hear from you. Beloved, again, our public and civic life as a church is mission critical. When combined with the message of the gospel, a gospel life marked by patience in doing God's kind of good provides quite the gravitational pull towards Christ for any with an earshot or eyesight. And the world is watching and listening. And they have their ideas about us. Let's prove what is wrong, wrong. Let's silence whatever haters we may have by standing for the truth in love. Let's be the cross-bearing counterculture of another king. Right? The sword he's possessed us to be in his mercy. The sojourning sword that he, by Peter, in our passage this morning, urges us to be. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for all your word and pray that in your great mercy and grace towards us in Christ it will now land with all the power of the Holy Spirit to convert hearts to save souls and to sanctify this church you have given us life and light help us not to be bashful about it Help us to live for you, to be set on a stand, to give light to all around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.